Hello everyone. Thanks for coming and paying attention to class today on Zoom. I have a special guest, John Cifuentes, a returning guest, and we're going to talk about innovation and launching innovation and all the different aspects of marketing that are very relevant to the space of trying to get something to take off and gain traction among some user group. Um, so John, can you give us a little bit of it about your background just to sure. reorient it? anyone who hasn't seen hey the previous video yeah you should watch it it's very uh... <laughs> anyway my name's john um yeah i work on disruptive innovation uh at a startup that i co-founded a few years ago we uh it's kind of like a hollywood studio but we build products instead of making tv shows or movies so we work uh with individual founders uh we work with our own internal ideas and we work with uh large multinational corporate customers to both figure out kind of on the demand side, what's a new product, what's like a product size hole in the universe that, uh, that we think belongs, that we think uh, would help people in some way, make them healthier or wealthier. And uh, we figure out ways to bring those to market quickly. Awesome. So um, yeah, you're focused every day on this topic, so it's highly relevant. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen for you. So you'll be able to see and all right here we go so we're trying to figure out um kind of what makes some launches successful and others failures so there's kind of a three categories that we'll touch on or organize our discussion around today so the first are aspects of the product itself or the offering the service that maybe makes it better able to catch on and go viral. Um, a little bit about consumer psychology that you can kind of think about and tap into in terms of launching and communicating about the new offering. And then crossing the chasm, which is around the people. So who do you want to focus on, be it companies or individual consumers that might be most receptive and most likely to get over people's fear and risk aversion and inertia, which is going to hold them back from trying something new and actually be excited. So how do you switch uh, kind of initial fears into a fear of missing out? So like creating that FOMO um, potentially. So most launches um, get put a bunch of money into it, a bunch of excitement, people's jobs, press releases. You've been involved as a reporter writing a bunch of press releases for products that we're supposed to be very successful and then they just fail to meet their objectives. So um, some initial smartwatches, even movies, as you talk about with the studio model, I think they put like, this is the biggest loss ever. Um, Johnny Depp was in uh, Lone Ranger and they poured tons of money into it and then no one wanted to watch it. Um, so obviously they wouldn't put in the money if they didn't think it wasn't gonna be a hit, but it was a failure. So. If you think about all the products you've seen launched as a reporter and now as a founder and working in that full time, what do you think are some of the causes or examples of failures in that post mortem you can kind of say, oh, I think that went wrong? I mean, I, maybe one of the biggest fallacies is just kind of insular thinking, like uh, deciding that this product needs to exist or serves a large group of people that they want to use on a daily basis when it's just when it's not a thing, when it's like a yeah. inward looking uh, corporate initiative to get some lift on some series of existing products. Um, I'm surprised, I'm curious where that 75% stack comes from because I'm surprised it's not much higher. Yeah, I mean, it depends also on industry, right? So like, I think the stats are worse for like number of new restaurants that can make it like one year. Um, yeah. I don't know, I think it's kind of like a, grabbed it out of the universe and who's going <laughs> to challenge you on 75%, I mean, with, but with, I, for a corporate initiative, I, I wonder if it would be something like that, but for a startup, I'm sure it's, you know, 95 plus percent. Yeah. Uh, are, are failures. That's right. And what's a failure too. Like one of my best friends, he raised some money, started a thing, had employees, had it going for three years and then it ultimately phased out, fizzled out. Right. Is that a failure? I, well, it's still impressive he was able to get a team, convince people to put in years of their life, get investors to yeah, put I, in I money. Yeah, think, I think so. I, th I think, you know, convincing investors that you have a good idea is not a, not an accomplishment. No, <laughs> okay. I like to tell him it's a, an accomplishment because otherwise he feels like shit. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, someone 
it's in some ways it's um the first step right so after that first step some failure occurred but i mean it's it's a, at the very least it's a good validation that you have an idea that other people are interested in but or they believe in, in you terms of, i mean it, it there's that i mean especially on the earliest of stages it's really about the team but it's uh, a thing that I'm hearing more reflected in the, the real world is uh, there are no new ideas <laughs> and it's really, you know, it's about the execution. Like it's, yeah. it's easy, especially in a corporate environment, a company that makes lots of products to come up with lots of ideas that, you know, sounds cool yeah. or could potentially help people. But it's really hard to like get a small group of people uh, just rigorously aligned around a, uh, a particular objective and then, execute on it for multiple years yeah we're using zoom right now and skype right was around and successful right. for a long time before that and so it wasn't a new idea to do video conferencing and you were just telling me about how you guys are working on another wrinkle to this space uh potentially yeah. so yeah if you abstract high enough all humans have kind of the same central main drivers like maslow's hierarchy of needs or right. amusement convenience safety security um belonging individual expression right there's kind of some core things but right the way that manifests itself in the world or the way it's it's done what i like about innovation is it uh can unlock um the ability to achieve those things with maybe less input or for the same input get more of that and then you hopefully expand the pie for everyone rather than just fighting over who gets the biggest piece um right but yeah, everyone wants to do something new and, and innovative, but the problem is oftentimes it fails. And I think the number one reason is just that the actual perceived benefit does not get over the inertia hump. So I'm doing research right now on customer inertia and mm. there's two sources that basically stem, stem from us just wanting to minimize costs. The first cost is we don't want to spend a lot of time thinking. So deciding, evaluating, considering, choosing, I, there's a whole you know, cognitive uh, process that we can just avoid by continuing doing what already works. So you get this inertia mindset. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right, so eh, it's good enough. Why should we change our habits, learn something new, uh, spend money? All those things are kind of fighting people from going off the chain. So for the people that invent something and launch something, they've already spent months, years, energy, learning about it there's no inertia for them for them the inertia is to continue to like whatever they develop because right that's already been at the place before the customer who's coming to it um for the first time and and when you get to like a mainstream customer you get all the risk aversion kind of fear uncertainty um whereas maybe you can have a few initial customers who are very much like eager to just try whatever is new because they're just a highly curious person um Right. And the other source of inertia that I'm looking at, besides the kind of uh, minimizing the cost of thinking, is minimizing the cost of regret. So if you, it, regret's considered like the most important emotion for post-decision, uh, like just consumer emotion for what guides behavior. And mm. people are fearful of trying something new and then regretting that they did it. Or finding out they should have upgraded and didn't do something new. So I think of my dad, like, you know, sticking with his CD collection when there's like Spotify. It's like, I've, I've got this whole collection. I know it. I know what I like. I can find everything. It's like, yeah, but dad, the collection's almost infinite on Spotify. Like, just switch. Um, but it's like, no, then you have to admit that all this kind of whole pile of CDs you've carefully collected, organized, and maintained um, maybe isn't as important as it was when you put it together. Um, so there's kind of some ego protective sunk cost bias that we also see in the literature that would be the other reason why people don't want to necessarily try something new. Um, other people talk about just the idea of being loss averse and not wanting to encounter failure um, as a consumer. But that inertia is underestimated by the creators because they don't experience it. They're not in that mindset of that, that consumer. You've kind of heard this, I'm sure, the idea that it has to be a 10x improvement at the same price or 10 times cheaper for the same performance because of that inertia hurdle. Um, so this is kind of the kind of example I think is funny. The first iPad was the Apple Newton launched a long time ago. Um, or a lot of people have these 
personal computing devices. I remember like when we were in college, some kids who were a little tech forward, maybe nerdy, they had their little like organization. I forget what they called them. Uh, they called there's Palm pilots. Yeah. Palm pilots before they had any phone technology. Um, mm. Well, what was cool about this is that you could write notes and then you could save them. You could save a lot of notes. So you just kind of use this pen here and you'd, you know, write notes in this kind of computer device. You could carry it around with you. It was very portable compared to other computers at the time. But there's this other product that existed <laughs> that also you could write notes and it had great memory, uh, store them, save them, carry them around with you lightweight. So it was, uh, yeah, technology that didn't really provide a solution or any improvement in benefit. I think when I pitch my crazy ideas to you, you always come back with me at the same thing. It's like, well, who's actually going to benefit from this? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, okay, fine. But the other aspect is maybe you do have something that's good, but you just screw up the launch. And so that's a little bit of what we're going to focus on more today. Um, and so it could be who you target, who you go after, um, just kind of the wrong group of people or spreading yourself too thin thin over too many different types of customers or sometimes it just comes to the competitive response so sony had a movie player a home cassette movie player that was technically superior to vhs but they lost out to vhs because vhs just licensed the technology to any manufacturer and so they basically created enough of the um product that anyone could build it and then create vhs tapes cassettes and they just got overwhelmed by the variety of offerings and the scale of the competitive response. So um, we're going to focus more on two, but number one is certainly relevant. It's just super obvious, I guess. Um, all right, so this is the the hope, the dream. And we see these fads all the time, like Beanie Babies, Pet Rocks. Um, this is the Cat Cafe. You can go get a sandwich and a and a coffee and there's cats that are there and just that, that simple thing creates the massive line. So, um, what you want to do is basically have one thing that is impactful for one person and then it gets that original consumer to become your evangelist, to provide testimonial, to reference and recruit more people. And that's what we think of with an idea or a product diffusing through the marketplace. So I guess like, in the case of our lockdown quarantine, Zoom, right? Just ramped up like crazy because, hey, I'm gonna use this, I like it, I wanna get a, on a call with you. So I'm like, hey, let's use this thing. So like in the communication, it's a social device, those things tend to be uh, something that can diffuse relatively quickly, but that means you can get replaced really quickly as Skype has kind of found out. Um, so there's kind of some academic research just talking about the different stages for each individual and then you scale that up to a societal level or to whatever the consumer segment is so when you guys are launching a product um, or when you're working as uh, in press and working with technology companies as a reporter what were some of the kind of examples of people doing this initial launch with awareness well and where do people kind of screw up in that first stage mm -hmm. 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Do I have good yeah. product examples for you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, the timing of this uh, recording wasn't ideal, but. No, it's fine. Um, I don't have a clean example. Right, off I got another question for you related. So how do you decide when to go from kind of privately showing some product you're working on to people that are kind of friends in the industry, maybe an important person at a, a company, if it's like a B2B space, and when do you decide, okay, let's make it more of this public launch? So like, what are your considerations? That's a good question. Yeah. I think at the, there's, there's two like lenses to look at this from. One is if you're trying to launch something on your own, or one is if you're launching something with a large corporate that has a already baked in distribution channel mm -hmm. of some kind. Um, on the case of launching your own thing, um, you know, without that support, I think it's best to tell as many people as possible, uh, you know, in product development in particular, because it's, it's what we just talked about uh, a few minutes ago is there's, there are no new ideas and execution's really hard. Yeah. And it's likely that the way you understand your product is 
completely different from the segments of customers or even your target customer. Uh, so just tell everyone and crystallize the idea. Like, you know, you hear this thing in startup land all the time about the elevator pitch, mm -hmm. like the elevator pitch. It's, it's a, it's really a bad metaphor for how people actually consume things. Yeah. Uh, Cause we're not yeah, on especially... elevators anymore. <laughs> you open your mouth on the elevator, you'll get punched. <laughs> yeah. And, and you don't have 30 seconds. Sure. Uh, so, so crystallizing the idea into one line uh, that's memorable and actually solves a particular problem. It's like really hard to do. Yeah. Uh, so in the case of launching something from nothing, it's uh, you have to be iterative and it's, you know, getting something to perfect and unveiling it. It's just uh, typically doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, whereas a, a large company has a lot more uh, risk to account for uh, corporate risk, brand yeah. risk, uh, career risk, yeah. uh, all these things people are thinking about that makes them more protective and, uh, you know, more along the lines of getting something to perfect and then architecting uh, a really uh, intentional sequenced launch. Yeah. And the other thing is if you're small, as you talk about, if you go out and tell people along the way, as you're, you know, working on it, you get the feedback, you see how it lands the pitch right. and you improve, you can do that same thing internally in a large company because you have an audience of internal members to, uh, talk to. It's just, they're going to be biased in terms of like, what do they have to gain to kind of give you harsh feedback? Um, and maybe they have a lot to gain by giving you false praise. Um, so yeah, I think one thing that's hard with this awareness is there's the awareness that there's a problem and there's the awareness of your version of the solution. So sometimes the problem is obvious and everybody experiences it and just no one knows if there's a solution to solve for it. Um, and then the other thing is people aren't even aware they have the problem yet. Like, uh, you know, I feel like Apple is a company that always gets talked about of like coming up with some solution where people didn't think it was a problem before. And then they're like, oh yeah, that sucks. So like most recently the AirPods and just trying to have, um, you know, Bluetooth disconnected devices. So you don't have the tangles and the cords and the straps or whatever. People didn't really realize how much of a pain it was because you just adapted to plugging it in and having the over the top headset or whatever. And then when they kind of had it and you get this more physical freedom, I guess people liked it a lot. I haven't made the leap to that product myself, but uh, I have some like Bluetooth devices with the, the back strap connecting the two earbuds. Um, but yeah, I think that is a lot of information for someone to take in and they're busy and why would they care to listen to you, think about you, hear about you? So um, it seems like what you guys do and have done is you have this podcast through which you have maybe an ongoing listenership and maybe they're there to hear you and Phil and all the interview guests you have just talk about technology in general. And then therefore they're not interested in knowing about your new product launch necessarily or thinking about the problem they have. But through that kind of built channel that you have, you can access them and get them aware of something that's coming out. Um, which I guess is the whole idea of PR is like there's some existing channels out there where people might go to for reasons other than to hear about products. Um, but you can access them through that. Um, the next step is, okay, you gave them a little teaser, like where the, uh, can you talk about that video thing you guys talked, just pitched, told me about or no? Uh, yes. I can't tell you who we're pitching it to, but, so like, um, you, just what, yeah, you kind of said it's the, this is this, like, can you kind of repeat that line? I did. Oh, yeah. It's, it's so what we're, this experience that we're doing oh. right now, Zoom chat, you know, this is Zoom has the best inbreed and consumer MPS and business MPS. So yeah. people really, really like using this product. Um, I think it's kind of fraught with uh, I think it's problematic. Sure. You know, I think it's fatiguing. It's, uh, you know, Cisco, maybe 30 years ago, figured out how to cram information uh, into a small uh, wire and be able to, for us to be able to have video. Yeah. Uh, but, but what we're experiencing is not uh, human to human communication where, uh, you know, there's some vague latency here. It's actually, when you do these all day, you get physically tired yes. because your body is doing all this cognitive processing. Like, Oh, what's Connor's nodding along. It's like a little bit after 
you know, what, when I'm saying it. Yeah. So my mind has to tell me, oh, Connor's agreeing with me. Um, you know, whereas if we were sitting in my living room, uh, all those cues would just happen naturally in real time. Yeah, one big difference I think is just you don't see yourself when you're talking to people normally. So yeah. that's just one extra bit of kind of input that you have to have your brain deal with. And it's like you want to be able to see yourself because you're curious and we're all curious to know what we look like or whatever when we're talking. But actually, it's super distracting. So you train yourself yeah. doing these calls to just completely create a blind spot for yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, there, or you end up like looking away a bunch. Um, but yeah, so it's a new experience for us to get used to, and you guys are trying to improve upon that further. Yeah, exactly. So, in for instance, in doing this presentation, you know, there's two little heads of us and your screen that we're all looking at. Yeah. But wouldn't wouldn't it be great if you just had your screen kind of in view with you, and you're like a newscaster, uh, you know, giving a performance? and taking us through the slides, you know, using gestures with your hands, you can shrink yourself, you can, you know, point your body uh, towards the slides, you can use any background, you don't need a green screen. Um, it's pretty cool. So yeah, you're overlaying some visual information in the camera space. So it's a virtual or augmented reality type experience. And with with a lot of these things, the confluence of technology timing is just like, it can't be overstated yeah. for uh for like everything really needs to fit into place. That product, that Apple product you showed uh, was just too early, right? Yeah. Like the battery sucks. The screen is not pleasing to look <laughs> at. Uh, there's not a library of things you can do on it. It has some pre-baked in use cases, but it doesn't have like a, an open network that people can create uh, experiences. Whereas, you know, the iPhone launched in 2008 and a bunch of those things uh, a bunch of those core technologies were just good enough yeah. to make that experience camera good touch screen. Well, I, 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 you know, note taking is an interesting yeah. example and that's, cl that's close to me. My co-founder is Phil Libin. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the, the founder and CEO of Evernote. And when Evernote came out, uh, there were dozens of ways of doing what, <laughs> you know, in, including <laughs> like, in, including this, yeah. like there's, like, there's so many ways to take notes, but it's, the screens were just good enough. The memories on the phone were just good enough uh, to actually build apps on the phone. Uh, the input was just yeah. interesting enough Cloud infrastructure, to want to use it. So you can get a note on one device and then it's there for you on the other device without having to Exactly, it. exactly, yeah. So, so, I mean, that creates all sorts of data, privacy and protections. And, and that's where, you know, Evernote was particularly good at being really public and really... Uh, wanting to build strong consumer trust and create a brand that represented trust. Like, Hey, we have all of your stuff. Like yeah. we're not going to read, we have to read it to give you services, but we're not going to tell anyone and you yeah. just have to trust. Us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the promise in the, the title Evernote um, is like that brand promise. And the logo was the elephant never forgets. Yeah. Um, is a good way of kind of having that, initial awareness um built into that simple communication like how do you you only get someone's attention barely and how do you communicate this solution that they already have this existing problem for or raise the problem and with it put the solution i think the yeah. point here in terms of these stages component is that with awareness you're not really trying to get them interested so don't necessarily excel like you're just surfacing the idea that a problem exists really or servicing it which is you kind of talked about the you started with the fatigue like you're really just servicing this issue so it's top of mind so that it potentially can get over that cost of thinking inertia that might exist already um, with the yeah. interest you have to make someone excited enough that it's getting over that kind of sunk cost fallacy or um, any regret that might be potentially encountered if they are going to take a chance on something new um and so what i like in terms of your story about that zoom improvement with bringing all the information augmented reality over the top of this screen like a weatherman type thing is it's it's kind of simple and but you started with hey maybe you've experienced some zoom fatigue um interest is like yeah i have experienced zoom fatigue you kind of clearly or su sufficiently in a succinct way uh talked about a potential solution so maybe i'll go seek some additional information about it. So that's where we get like inbound marketing, people who are really good at um, having landing pages with a lot of informative information, videos, podcasts, um, multimedia. So it's almost like nowadays, um, 
you have to have your own journalism team at any sufficiently large company if you're going to be trying to uh, transition people from you know a little bit of awareness they search you out and now you have to kind of help educate them on the full space um, as they seek additional information yeah you ux writer is a hot job yeah. right now and a high, high paid highly paid job it might just be like a journalist journalism student or someone from journalism who got laid off at some major newspaper organization that existed for many years but now is downsizing but now all these yeah. companies are hiring them evaluation so this is this idea of mental simulation where we try to simulate what the experience would be like actually using it um so imagining ourselves and what that can do is that can kind of make it feel like that experience has come come to life so um, how do you kind of help facilitate that, make it really easy for someone to imagine themselves in that situation? I think a technology that people are excited about there is like augmented reality. So if you're going to get new furniture for your house and you want to shop online, well, you can look at your house through your phone and there'll be an overlaid couch there for you to kind of simulate. So helping people imagine their life in that setting. Um, you see a lot of commercials in marketing where they show a similar or aspirational version of you um, doing the thing and being excited happily using it. The problem is you get someone to try something then, but then they might experience it and be like, oh, that's not as good as I had hoped. So like you show a cool snowboarding video and I'm like, oh, I want to go snowboarding. Then I go snowboarding. My experience is nothing like the video I saw. Um, so when the mental simulation crashes, how do you help people through that initial um, kind of uh, discouragement they might experience. Um, and so uh, oftentimes it involves some trial where there's no commitment involved. So someone just gets to try it before they have to fully adopt it. And providing a lot of support there is critical. So a lot of my students end up getting hired by some like business to business technology company in the Bay where their job is basically to help onboard new customers and make sure that the trial is successful and people have a positive experience using the new software to um, get whatever they need to get done. And hopefully that, that leads to adoption. So that's this kind of individual level, but then ideally you can take your initial customers and have them go bring other customers through this whole process. So they help spread awareness. They kind of sell the reason for someone to be interested. They really can help with this evaluation and trial because like, hey, use my phone, use this device. Um, try this new thing I've tried. And so people being social and wanting to share and, and spread news to each other, um, it can be a really efficient way for a product to take off. If you empower your users to give them the right language, the right use cases, the free trials, all those kind of tools to empower them to help with this diffusion for similar others. Um, so it's kind of like the stages and then you can kind of see as it goes up to the social level that it's really about diffusion through a population. So how does anything, an idea, a product, a fashion, um, Beanie Babies kind of go from obscure or new to the main thing? So we kind of think of um, how innovative it is, so how much kind of initially something is valuable, and then how much people will basically evangelize for us or demonstrate it or show the product to similar customers and then there'll be an imitation factor as well. So right now this is a little bit too close to home, but um, I, we know now very clearly that viruses spread through populations and there's kind of two factors we care about. So one is the likelihood you'd be exposed and then second is the likelihood that the exposure will take hold, um, or the virus will take hold upon exposure. So like obviously coronavirus is spreads through just potentially talking or singing or being indoors and sharing the same airspace. And so it's going to be uh, a quarantine and mask that are going to cut down on that likelihood to be exposed. If it's like a sexually transmitted disease, it's a little bit less likely you'd be exposed to it. Uh, it requires a further hurdle of behavior <laughs> to be exposed that's less common. Um, and so that's going to make it more viral. And then the other thing is just how contagious it is. So we all know about the spike aspect of the protein. And that means that like, if you get exposed, it's actually pretty good at like locking into your receptors. Well, apparently 
about 35% of the population has maybe already been exposed to similar coronaviruses and maybe has some T cells that'll fight it off. Maybe if you're healthier, younger, take your vitamin C, don't drink or smoke or whatever, I don't know, just if you have good health habits, you'll be more likely to fight it off before it kind of takes hold. Um, now, for us, in the marketing context, we want to think about how to improve both of these quotients or these factors, and then it'll be more likely that whatever we have will diffuse through the population faster. The other thing we'll talk about is, who's your population? If you define your population as too big, and there's not as much kind of communication among different nodes in your population, or if that population is kind of effectively quarantined from itself, well then, um, although you say there's a bigger total, total addressable market, you're less likely to reach anyone there because the R naught, as we kind of take from the virus, is too small. Um, so like for each person that gets uh, kind of infected, they're not infecting others with the product. So a lot of our marketing decisions we can kind of think about as, is it going to help me with either of these two aspects? And if it does, be it, you know, who we decide to target or our marketing mix itself, our communication strategy, how simple um, our pitch is, then it's more likely to um, be effective. So this is kind of a overview of what we kind of think of as the marketing strategy frameworks. These are kind of all the aspects put onto one page of what you care about as a marketing manager. So just kind of initial situation analysis of your customers or the variety of customers, the differences amongst them, and which differences you think are most material, your company or yourself, your own capabilities, your uniqueness versus competitors. And then with all that in consideration, you kind of think about the different segments of consumers, which differences among customers are relevant to the context you care about. Um, ideally, there's some group that's easy to identify that you can target to go after, and then you position yourself with all the aspects of your marketing mix, the product, the distribution, the way you talk about it, communicate with the promotion. Um, and then down at the bottom, you're really concerned about the kind of actual individual decisions that consumers make, so to be acquired or not, to expand and buy additional services or not. Uh, are they going to leave you? Retention issues, which we just talked about with the idea of having people there to support people through the initial experience with the product where it might be actually a little bit harder to use than what was been promised in all the messaging to get initial interest. And then contagion is the kind of last part of the customer management decision portfolio where you think about, I got one customer, how do I help that customer become a uh, entry point to grab new customers? So throughout kind of under thinking about in the context of a new product or something that's being launched, um, all these decisions, we want to think how these decisions are going to increase either the likelihood a target customer is going to be exposed or that the exposure takes hold. So we might go after a segment that might be suboptimal in how attractive it is, but because they communicate a lot with each other, we think it'll end up helping down here with this contagion aspect. So the story about, um, you might know the details better than me, but eBay beat some other online auction company that had raised way more money and was going after like the B2B space. And because they were targeting customers who were traders and collectors, those groups already had like online message boards and talked a lot to each other and frequently were buying. And so there was a lot um, more contagion and that's eBay just destroyed the other company because they initially focused on a target segment that had a lot of exposure already kind of built into its existing social fabric. So, um, anyways, we're going to transition now to talk about the five factors of the product itself that can make something be much more likely to take off versus kind of, even though it could be, you know, still pretty good, maybe not take off quite as much. So, um, I'm, I'm really, I'm curious about this section because, uh, just in general with marketing, it's way easier to do marketing on a good product. Yeah. So the first uh, factor is being good. But all okay. the other four yeah. are more kind of like <laughs> assuming, given some product, what can you do? Um, yeah. So the initial research was actually done by a guy who I think was at the University of Purdue, and he studied farms and farm technology and how quickly farm technology was adopted and spread throughout the farming community. And he looked at a bunch of different variables that might predict how fast something would spread through 
the kind of total farming population in the region. And he did some regressions and saw that, you know, just five factors, depending on slight variations in context, explained over half and sometimes as much as 90% of the variation in how fast something took off. So um, maybe I have some kind of stories or examples, but I'd be curious if you um, have anything that resonates with you. So the guy's name was Roger, and <laughs> so it's Roger's five factors. The first one is just how much better it is than the incumbent. So that's kind of like, okay, if something's great, then <laughs> it's going to do better. Um, but number, the rest two through five are all kind of things that you can do small, slight things, even if it's just communication. Maybe you don't change the product, but you change how it's described um, to help. So is it compatible with the existing ways of doing things? So you're kind of avoiding that inertia. Um, how complex it is, obviously that would hurt. So having things simple helps a lot. Is it easy to try and is it easy to observe? Um, so the relative advantage is just how much better it is to the predecessor. And you can't do a lot about um, that once you've kind of built the product, but you can be thoughtful around the benefits you talk about. So like hedonic benefits, usually you can kind of add on after the fact. How do you just make it seem to have high status, prestige? You see influencer marketing being like the fastest growing promotional avenue right now with um, you know people on social media who have followings because they're trying to do status, prestige, and also get that initial awareness. Utilitarian benefits are usually more objective and harder to kind of like, you know, just create in someone's brain. It has to kind of exist in the real world. But um, one example is how often we end up sticking with something that has lower relative advantage, but this is an example really of the inertia. So this is our typical keyboard, the QWERTY keyboard, Q-W-E-R-T-Y. And it's color coded here based on what keys are touched most frequently in uh, at least the English language. Mm. And so we did a really stupid job of laying out the keyboard, but because it's what the way it was laid out first, it kind of stuck. We would basically improve the GDP of the knowledge economy by 85% if we just rearrange these keys to be have all the vowels right here and all the most common consonants right here. Because then you won't have to move your fingers so much, just which one goes up and down. Every time you have to go reach up for that E, that's carpal tunnel syndrome. Big carpal, big, uh, yeah, big doctor, big pharmacy big, is big wrist doctor. Yeah, is making sure that we keep this keyboard. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know exactly, but something like they've said that people who um, have switched their keys manually get something like a twenty to eighty percent improvement in like typing speed and can actually connect their thinking to the typing a little bit easier, um, which is crazy. So this is how it should be basically. Mm. At least that's one layout that people have recommended. Um, you think like Q, you know, you just put it down here. It's not used that often. Um, but E right there, you can just pound that E. A, you know, all the vowels are here. So, um, how can you get something that has a high utilitarian uh you know benefit to be adopted like why don't we make this switch it's going to improve our economy i should run for president on a change the keyboard platform like how could we actually get people to do it well as marketers we could try to focus on the hedonic benefits so do you get some high status people to do it um do you i don't know try to you know um, make it more prestigious to use it. It'd be kind of hard to do that. Um, you could do the utilitarian uh, benefits where you try to emphasize how it's you know more convenient or less expensive in total cost because you're not going to get carpal tunnel syndrome or something like that. But um, those are diffuse benefits way off in the future and is an initial cost of actually learning something new. And so people aren't going to switch because anything where there's a big benefit way off in the future, we usually always choose our current self and screw over our future self um, as just kind of our natural inclinations to be um, now oriented. So what's the solution to this problem? Do you have any guesses? No. So government interaction, <laughs> just ban the okay. old keyboard. 
Okay. Uh, or two, you just find people who haven't used the keyboard yet. So you focus on new users, like um, children, like go to schools or whatever and have them just start doing it. Um, so that's that comes down to who you're going to target. Um, compatibility is the degree to which something's consistent with the existing values and experiences. So we don't want to make people have changes. We don't want to have them ask them to have different values, different perceptions, different beliefs. You look at right now, people wearing masks, it seems to be fighting with their whole value system, who, their identity of who they are. It's not compatible with the freedom-loving American. Oh, I can't wear a mask, right? Um, so how do you uncover that? So here's uh, plastic corks apparently keep wine from spoiling better than traditional corks, but having a plastic cork doesn't feel very cool when you open up your bottle of wine. So right. they just make them try to look like old corks. It's more compatible. There's less resistance. There's less kind of negativity around it. So it's cheaper to produce than actually getting cork trees and um, potentially works better. Um, that's just one example. Another example is when DVR came out, it's all digital. There's nothing being wound, right? Remember those uh, rewinders? You could like take it out of the VHS and put it in. It would rewind it really quickly. And the movie literally is being you know, based off this tape that needs to be wound up and rewound. So just having the language of rewind as part of the way they messaged it, even though technically there was nothing being wound, um, helps make it seem more compatible. So there's all these different aspects of your product and you want to think what's the incumbent and how can we just make it seem as similar? The problem is oftentimes if you're the one producing the new thing, you want to talk about how it's different. You don't have to wind. Let's come up with a new name, uh, just start over or go back. Um, well, it emphasizes that things are different and maybe there's some reasons why that difference is better, but it's less compatible. So maybe eventually you leak in new terminology, but initially you want to just piggyback to all the mental concepts that are already there. So small, small little things can actually um, make a big difference. I listened to an awesome podcast where they talked about the designer of the keyboard on the iPhone and how much care and how involved Steve Jobs actually was in terms of getting the keyboard right. Because... Over here, the BlackBerry, which was popular, the keyboard is taking up, you know, 50% of the real estate of the phone's face, but it's only being used, let's say, 50% of the time. Or maybe the use of the keyboard could go down to only 10% of the time if you made more room, because then you might have other use cases come to the forefront. So I think uh, many people before the iPhone launched kind of just thought it was ridiculous that anyone would spend so much money if they weren't a business person. And if they're a business person, the main thing they want to do is type. So a blackboard very is, is better. So that's why they obsess so much over the keyboard itself and did little things like making a clicking sound every time you touch the key, made it seem more compatible. Uh, eventually it got annoying. People would turn it off, um, the clicking noise. They allowed you to not have it there, but that initial way felt a little more familiar, a little bit more compatible with your existing way of, of believing. So it felt like less of a thing you were giving up, that you were losing, that you were having to separate yourself from. Um, and so it cuts down on that experience of like loss or missing something. Let's the benefits come to the forefront. But any thoughts on those two? Well, I think a through line that's coming through for me with all these examples is focusing on customer experience and empowerment as an emotion mm. uh, to enable where, you know, the example with the iPhone is the it's extremely intentionally designed that way, but the customer can kind of choose, uh, you know, how and where to access the keyboard and the experience is so much richer. It, this is a good example of where the technology was like just good enough yeah. on the iPhone. Like, I don't know if you've used an original iPhone yeah. or even when they came out yeah. or somewhat recently, like, it's terrible. Yeah, so bad. <laughs> but but it was just good enough. Like it was it was just good enough to be engaging. Yeah, yeah exactly. Having having haptic feedback even be a thing on a screen, yeah. like just just existed. They didn't have haptic uh, feedback on version one. It was all just sound feedback. It's just well there you go. Yeah, yeah exactly. So now yeah, now they got it so it could you could get a little bit of a physical response. Yeah. Um but that was like a newer uh thing they brought out further on in the development. 
Yeah, I think um, a, a additional with that empowerment is eventually you can let people turn it off. Because it's annoying to hear that clickety-click sound, but we were used to it. Like, if you could have made a BlackBerry with physical keys that didn't have a clickety sound, you would have done it, but it, it had a physical component. It had some actual right. vibrations going on producing that sound. So now you say, oh, a quiet way to text is much better. Um, you can, you know, text without anyone hearing. But... Um, at first, they wanted to have that sound because it made it have that feedback, have that feel natural, and then eventually it kind of faded out. It went from like on all the phones to being able to choose to turn it off to being able. Now I think the default just they don't really have it. Um, at least that's my experience. <laughs> so yeah, just overall, don't fight inertia. Um, complexity. It's just the degree to which some innovation is perceived. Again, and our kind of throughput is all these things are in the mind of the consumers. So oftentimes the creators aren't aware of this because they're using it so much that they've gotten used to everything. So you got to approach it as someone who's encountering it for the first time and what's their mindset. So the perception of how difficult it is to understand and use. And that's why however much anyone invests in customer education, you should probably double or triple it. Like if you believe in something, invest in customer education at least initially and customer experience mapping i think that's something you guys are uh, very thoughtful about in terms of design but i think the video game industry gets a lot of credit for like just making each level just difficult enough that it's it kind of grabs you and it challenges you but isn't so hard that you're like oh screw this game um but um you can also just communicate it <laughs> it's so easy a baby could do it it's so easy a caveman could do it. Uh, those campaigns have kind of gone away as people have become, you know, used to and not threatened by, oh my gosh, banking online or trading stocks online or buying insurance online. Uh, I think you said one time there was like a, a fire and you instantly bought life insurance or something like that. Um, uh, rental insurance with lemonade. <laughs> yeah. my Across the street from me, the building was on fire and I, I got a policy in less than 90 seconds. <laughs> uh, which is, yeah hilarious how far it's come but at the time you know i remember trying to convince my dad to like do anything on the computer other than just read information he was so threatened by it um, and so they spent you know tons and tons of money on just messaging it's easy it's easy it's easy you can do it if a baby can do it you can do it if a caveman can do it you can do it um so it can be design it can be investing in support and it can be messaging those are all three aspects where you can um, do it. I think, yeah, I love listening to your guys' podcasts about the design aspect because I learn a lot there. In insurance is a unique example uh, when talking about uh, marketing mm -hmm. in, in its context with innovation. Like the insurance industry has not been very innovative in the last hundred plus years. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a few companies. I think if you talk to most consumers, they know they need insurance. They don't understand how it works. Uh, <laughs> They don't. They definitely don't understand what uh, policies they should be choosing mm -hmm. for themselves. Like our brains just aren't set up to do that kind of math, and that's why uh, these insurance companies they spend more than any other uh, in terms of industry um, than any other uh, broad industry on branding and marketing. Yeah. Like everyone knows the caveman, everyone knows the lizard, or whatever yeah. gecko. Uh, we don't like. That's a company just trying to create a mental hook and something familiar yeah. uh, and doing it enough. And, and it, it's a good example of how a lot of in, uh, products that come out that could be thought of as innovative, they just don't get enough money behind them in marketing to actually do a test, like a, a significant test, whether or not uh, their thing should exist. Like all these insurance companies are the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, they, can, they can't. Uh, compete on experience because it's the exact same thing. Well, also, so the, the, thing like, the experience that you care about is how it goes when something goes wrong. Yeah, exactly. And you don't actually want to encounter that experience. Um, so they right. just sell you the peace of mind uh, or maybe right. peace of mind at the lowest cost um, yeah. or simplest experience. So, yeah, you don't really know if you like an insurance company until you have to try to get some coverage or redeem your coverage. And in terms of complexity, Oftentimes, you know, those are the most complex uh, contracts. You know, you pay however many money, you know, a month, a year, whatever, car insurance, or house insurance, rental insurance, whatever, life insurance. But the actual policy itself is like way overly complex 
because they got all these, you know, clauses that have been carefully written. So you almost feel like you're being taken advantage of as soon as you're hitting a grade, but you're just like, I just got to accept right. it. Um, right. I don't know why. Yeah, it'd be interesting if any of them competed on having the simplest contracts. But I guess you might be then advertising for adverse selection, trying to get people who might take advantage of you because it's like, no questions asked, we're going to process your claim. Well, okay, now all the scammers come after <laughs> that insurance company. Right. right. Um, I do know some people are trying to think of like, are there signals we can use that aren't illegal because there's a lot of legal regulation of insurance. Um, like, for instance, how much your phone is uh, battery is charged. Or I remember like, with my car, they tried to put a tracker in so they could see like how fast I would break. And if I was braking fast, then right. they were going to give me a higher rate than if I was kind of braking slowly. Um, but yeah, I think it's just a scary industry and um, you could invest way more in education, way more in the experience over time. That's the other part of this mapping is like, what's the day one experience like? And then what's that experience, you know, when you actually need to make an insurance claim? Uh, I've switched car insurance providers until I found one that the actual experience of redeeming the claim was actually simple and useful because that's when you're under the most stress, you're feeling the pain. So, you know, if they can handle that right, then you get these, you know, other customers becoming your evangelist and trusting you. Life insurance is the hardest because it's like, you're dead. <laughs> so you don't even know how the claim process goes. <laughs> I guess if uh, you experience it as a benefactor, maybe that could be a place where it would show up. Um, but you always hear like that's a place where a lot of scammy sales tac tactics happen too. Okay, the last one's trial ability. We've gotten really good at this. Um, just the extent to which something can be experimented with on a limited basis. So. Um, in Silicon Valley, oftentimes you raise a bunch of money from some VC firm and then basically subsidize the, you know, first couple experiences or all your early users are basically getting more value than the cost because they're just trying to get enough people to try it and talk about it. Did you see that example about the pizza shop um, who was doing Grubhub recently got in the news? Oh, he just started buying his own pizzas. Yeah. So, yeah. so on Grubhub, they... We're charging eighteen dollars, and his restaurant was twenty-four dollars a pizza, and they would pay the restaurant twenty-four dollars. So the customer is basically getting a, a six-dollar discount. So he just started buying his own pizzas and said, "I just want," he said, "just give me the crust with nothing on it." Uh, so that was kind of hilarious. But um, to what extent do you guys think about that idea of like subsidizing trials to get those initial users versus? trying to see, okay, we're going to actually charge people up front because that's the strongest test to see if this has the value that will be needed to take this all the way. I think this is a controversial topic, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, the example you stated with uh, food delivery, yeah. like what, what's the problem in that industry? Uh, I guess the experience in working with individual restaurants is... Varied. It's varied, yeah. you know, it's, it's mostly poor. So complexity, um, heterogeneity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we've created these networks, these systems that have homogenized it in some degree and give us a consistent experience. Um, the good part is that it's a good experience and it's convenient. Yeah. The bad part is, you know, it's extractive yeah. or like it ruins <laughs> whole industries yeah. or, but it doesn't matter because there's enough mass of people using it that that's, this is direct, the direction we want to go. If um, the cost can get driven down enough to make it so there's enough value added for all the participants, which right now it seems right. like that's a oh, big question right. mark. <laughs> Rest, small restaurants hate Yelp. Yeah, you know, and yeah. hate the, the delivery services are you know parasitic in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, this this will be a big thing for the industry to figure out in the next couple of years, especially as you know most restaurants close. And I think Uber's the, trying to acquire Grubhub, um, so it'll be Gruber, and we'll see if that right. can actually go through. Some people are thinking that it would consolidate um, the number but, um, of players too much. But in terms of a business product, this whole this freemium, yeah, uh, 
no charge charge money for your product uh pricing is actually like really hard to do yeah. and most startups that launch new products uh far underprice their products um so it's you know kicking off in the consumer side from the out outset that the perceived value of their thing is actually pretty low yeah. especially if you're willing to give it away for free yeah so i think you have to be really careful around the extent that you want people to try things because why would they you know buy things just on the promise of value but right. you don't want to dilute your value you want to actually have the strongest test of are we adding enough value in the world that we deserve to be compensated at the rate that will sustain us. Um, so I always ask my students when they get their first job offers, and now things are complicated because the job market has kind of been paused, but always negotiate, even if it's a standard offer where they basically give all their people the exact same offer. I say, you want that practice of communicating that you have an intention to add a certain amount of value and right. getting good at that communication process will pay off later down the road and also brands you in the mind of those companies and to yourself that you intend to add value and can communicate that you'll add value. And it makes students extremely uncomfortable, but I'm like, if you don't do this now, when are you ever going to get comfortable when the stakes get higher? Um, yeah. And so oftentimes, you know, depending on the job, they'll get, you know, five, 10% higher uh, offers than they initially were given. But sometimes they get told like, hey, we just hired entry level jobs. Everybody gets the same thing. And I say, you can still come back and say like, okay, if I do add all this value, when's that next kind of point where we have a conversation where things get um, reevaluated and you can kind of at least get that put down on paper. Even if that's standard, you get it on paper, you've now get some confidence that you've um, gone through the process. I've had like two students out of maybe 150 come back to me and said that a job offer was basically pulled because the person was insulted. And I was like, well, that sucks. I'm sorry. I told you to do something and now you're, but I promise you, you don't want to work for that person. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, that's a, you know, early career advice that stuck with me is, you know, don't ask, don't get. Yeah. And, and same thing with, with the company. If you can't ask right. your customers to pay you, maybe you're not delivering enough value or you're not doing a good enough job communicating how right. you plan to deliver value. Um, and so, yeah, those were generally like small business owners who the two things were small business owners who basically felt like insulted or like it was they were didn't want to deal with someone so entitled who would ask for right. more value. It's like, hey, I plan to add value. I'm sincere. I'm going to commit. I have other options. You got to pay me for my opportunity cost. Um, yeah, the, the, those students save themselves longer term pain. Yeah, I think now there'd be a little bit more pressure probably just to take something, but even with a bad Vosser company, but um, I would still say if you can, uh, try to at least engage them in the conversation. And always you can reply, say like, hey, would you want to hire someone who won't ask to get their full value? Uh, right. No, I, I'm going to be representing you. The last one is just how observable or how visible um, the innovation is or the product is. So how do you make it so easy for your users to communicate that they're getting value out of it? So this story I think is um, hilarious. So when internet um, or no satellite TV came out, it was like this really cool thing, high status thing, cause you're getting your TV from outer space. And you know, it's like uh -huh. the space age, like I'm getting my TV beamed down from something orbiting the globe. And so, DirecTV found out, I, I forget if it was DirecTV or their competitor, but one of these satellite companies um, found out that the likelihood of the neighbors also getting it installed was highly predicted on whether the antenna was put on the front of the house or the back of the house. <laughs> so if it's on the front of the house, at the time it was this high status product, all the neighbors would see it and then quickly get it as well. It's like keeping up with the Joneses or whatever. If it's on the back of the house, you know, there was less of this kind of spillover effect between the initial customer and their neighbors. Um, and so this picture just cracks me up, this beautiful veranda where you could kind of enjoy your morning coffee is being ruined by this, you know, big uh, antenna, but probably the owners were proud to have it put in at the time. <laughs> so like, everyone look at my big antenna. I get my TV from space. And meanwhile, it's, you know, hideous looking <laughs> nowadays. We'd uh, try to make them as small as possible. Um, but if you can make your product have some status, some prestige, and it's highly visible, 
it'll be a huge boon. If it's low status or associated with people that um, the general user doesn't want to be associated with, it'll backfire. So like, you remember the Google Glass? Like the glass holes who would have the Google Glasses on and get it broken and stuff? You know, if they had, I don't know if it's even possible, like who wants to wear glasses if they don't have to? Like there's a reason why contacts are popular. Um, but if they had done it in a way that maybe more like how Snapchat tried to do it with kind of cooler, hipper people adopting those classes first, it could have been at least had a pol positive spillover versus that. I mean, it's a good example of a too early product yeah. or, you know, product that doesn't solve any particular problem or a product where the technology isn't yeah. ready for the experiences that it's promising. It's just, and no one wants to, yeah. Have a big uh, choo glasses. Cho choose, choose to look stupid. Yeah. Although these people did choose to look stupid in my opinion with their, their satellites, but yeah, on your face is an additional hurdle to overcome. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of it on the five aspects of the, the product in terms of the design, the investing in support, um, and in communication. Um, any other kind of takeaways that you can capture for this end of this portion of the talk? I'm um, thinking through examples of, uh, well, and, and if, if we're, is this strictly speaking to launching new products or is this trying to be disruptive or, you know, what's the yeah, goal? Yeah, a lot of these would apply more framework. broadly. Um, yeah. But it's especially salient when it's something new and you're trying to get a few initial users and then get those initial users to become uh, references and testimonials and, and points to look at for another user. What came to mind for you that maybe was outside of that use or that case? Well, I, I think, no, it's st sticking in that use case. Something you mentioned was, you know, spending more on customer research mm. and that's that, that like, that can't be overstated Yeah, is the, the importance of user testing uh, interviews observed uh, user testing. Just you're going to discover so many ways that people use your product that you didn't even know or use cases. Yeah, I get um, cast a lot as like a data guy because I like data. I love, you know, spreadsheets, charts, whatever, doing analysis of it. But just actually having a conversation with customers is, you know, about as rich a data as you could get. And if you don't have yeah. a lot of data points because it's something new or something early, talk to people. Like, uh, right. <laughs> oftentimes people. Um, reach out to me and say, hey, what should I do in this context? I say, have you talked to them? <laughs> like, did you have a right. conversation? Have you sat down and just given, seen people use something or try to explain it to them and see how that explanation is not really landing? Um, which I think goes back to your kind of initial point of early and often communicate about your product, tell everyone, but don't just tell them the exact same messaging over and over, refine your messaging to get it as simple right. as possible so that they could hopefully one, understand it easily. And then two, communicate it to another person. Um, I think that's like a good test. Like if I tell you something and then watch you tell someone else, how does that telephone work? Like what's the right. telephone of your product? If the telephone of your product is um, consistent, and it's understood like three people down the chain, then you probably got, you're probably ready for some success. But, well, we're going to move on to the next stage, which is um, just thinking about the psychology that's relevant. And there's two books that are been around for a while, especially this initial one. Robert Cialdini is a psychologist who talks about persuasion and marketing. And a lot of people who are in sales like this book. It's a very, um, recommended book influence and then persuasion um and they can be bought very cheaply uh on amazon used but here's kind of the cliff notes that's relevant so first is that um social proof is so key in uh getting to mainstream customers because you get those initial early adopters those people who like to try new things who like to be trendsetters but uh, the vast majority of customers that you need to break through and, and get to scale to be profitable are resistant to change, are risk averse. Um, and so what they do is they look to follow the crowd. There's a fear of doing stepping outside the crowd, and there's also a fear of missing out. And so the research, the psychology research behind it, like the Stanley Milgram conformity, uh, conformity experiments are all these different experiments that... Um, document how much we just do things simply because someone else is doing it. Uh, in this case, they looked at people who 
would stop and look up in the sky and see how many passerbys would also stop to look up in the sky to see what you know the first person's looking at and one of the cool findings is the more initial people you have looking up the higher the probability of the next person who walks by stops to look up so it's kind of like this critical mass that you need to kind of get that next person and then too it really depended on um how similar the people were so they did it with like professors and students if professors were looking up, students would walk right by, but another professor would stop and they would look up. And if it was students who were looking up, professors would walk right by, but other students would stop and look up. So um, being really thoughtful around who your initial users are. And instead of doing freemium, you might just let a few initial like beta customers or whoever use it for free because they have that similarity, that stature, that credibility that you can kind of latch on to. Um, and then have other users say, oh, if they're doing it, I don't want to miss out. I want to keep up with, you know, that high status company or high status consumer. Um, and so right now I think you see in like injuries and Horowitz, I think they have this whole fund that's basically dedicated to like influencers where they get influencers to be investors early on. And then they hope that that'll basically get more mainstream users to also come along for the ride but um celebrity endorsement that's your aspirational self and then you have your like real self where you're looking for something more authentic someone who's like you um so like both of those two selves you can kind of have be relevant um so yeah i i know that just having conversations with you on the side you guys are pretty well connected with some higher status people in the valley that can help um get you good feedback and potentially provide those endorsements. Um, it's just amazing the importance of it. Like we had a research talk in our department uh, yesterday that looked at um, Amazon ratings and Yelp ratings and seeing how influential uh -huh. those are on people um, picking a restaurant and or picking to buy a product. And what was crazy was how important the number of ratings were even if the product quality or the star rating was worse than something that had fewer ratings, but a higher uh, star rating. Interesting. So like you could be like a four point, uh, you could be a 3.7 and be the product or restaurant that's a 4.0 if you had a hundred more ratings than them, like 50 versus 150. You had a higher probability of getting picked. So, which is also mind boggling because the more ratings you have, the more confident you should be that the actual star rating is like the true value so it's like it's worse it's been rated more so you should be more confident that it's worse but people end up still choosing it because it's just the idea of like safety in numbers um which was kind of mind-boggling as i was hearing about all the experiments that provided the evidence for that effect um so whole businesses are built on this as i just mentioned with these amazon ratings so yeah, the fact that this has been rated 2,806 times, a lot, I guess a lot of people anchor on that as much or more so than the actual star rating itself. Um, this is just like a, a goofy shirt where people actually buy it just so they can do crazy reviews. Um, but like Yelp is another whole business built on the idea that we care a lot about what other people are doing. If we didn't care, like Yelp wouldn't exist. Um, Another thing is we're very sensitive to someone in authority, uh, maybe even less so in the United States than a lot of other cultures, but it's still relevant here and respect. So the psychology behind this, or the experiment that kind of documented this was they sent grad students to uh, turn left at intersections and they would wait for a red light on that left-hand turn. They would get to the front of the line and then when it turned green, they wouldn't move. And they would just wait how long it took for the person behind them to honk the horn uh, for them not, not turning left once it turned green. And so that was the dependent variable they cared about. And the independent variable they cared about was what the car was that they were in. So either in the grad students kind of beat up old car or the professors like fancy BMW. And if they were in the BMW, it took the car behind them, uh, I think, two or three times as long to honk the horn. Once the light turned green, then if they're in the beat up um, kind of older car. Wow. But the other kind of funny thing about the study was um, it took 
they document the gender of the person behind them, or you know, they would guess what the gender was of the car behind them that was honking the horn. And men and women both honked at the same speed. But when they did a survey asking people how long it would take them to honk, people said regardless of the car, they would honk right away, like after three seconds. And men said they would honk even faster than women. But so like we think this isn't that prevalent. And men think they're less influenced by authority and respect than women think they are. But in actual behavior, what was documented in the study was uh, we're actually very much influenced by kind of status symbols and or like authority respect. And that um, even men or people who don't think they're as influenced uh, as they are, it, it's very pervasive that um, that exists. So that's why things like New York Times bestseller lists matter, matter so much. Right? You get that endorsement by some, you know, uh, something that has authority. So this is an example of, of that kind of backfiring or being funny. But this guy's a pastor in Seattle area. And he did a humble brag tweet that said, my wife is so thrifty. We're at the dollar store getting stuff for our son's birthday when we heard we hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. So how did some pastor from Seattle get to the New York Times bestseller list? Well, he hired a marketing company, paid them $200,000 to ensure that his book, A Real Marriage, made it to the top of the bestseller list. And what did he ask this marketing company to do? Did they promote it? Did they put them on YouTube videos? Did they, uh, you know, have a really creative design for the front cover of the book? No, they just bought $200,000 worth of books, pocketed $10,000, and if you buy $200,000 worth of books, you end up on the bestseller list. Uh, so now this guy can go around and give talks and say he's New York Times bestseller. And also, you know, a bunch of more books were sold after they made the bestseller list. Because then people will interview him. Oh, your book must be great. You're on the New York Times bestseller list, which is especially delicious, I think, because he's you know a pastor, so presumably he cares about like honesty and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, if you can make it, I think in your world, like to the top of, I don't know, uh, tech meme or whatever. Yeah. Um, or if you have a a famous venture capitalist invest in you, right? That's that big status symbol that oh maybe this product's actually good um, which can be a self-fulfilling prophecy because then it's easier to hire that next employee who's really good which will make the product really good um, yeah so the other the kind of final psychology um kind of quick fun thing i'll talk about is scarcity which is just actually i think the one that's overdone the most and actually the place where people embarrass themselves the most um, Google Glass actually did this a lot. They're like, oh, a limited release. Only uh, a thousand of these available. And then they got bought. And then like a week later, they said, limited release, only a thousand. It's like if you say like, going fast, well, why are you advertising then? You know, you always see those like, get your tickets now. It's going fast. Uh, if it's going so fast, you wouldn't have to spend money on this advertisement to tell me to get my tickets now. It's going fast. But we are creatures of FOMO. We have that fear of missing out. And so... If you can artificially manipulate the scarcity um, in a way that is not transparently inauthentic, um, it'll work. If you do it in a way that seems inauthentic, you'll seem desperate and it'll backfire. So one thing that is the first time I learned this lesson, we were as uh, like 18, 19, 20, I forget how old we were, but in Sacramento, one of my friends, it was his birthday, he wanted to go out and like go to the club. And so we paid the uh, bouncer extra money to get in, to not wait in the line because it was his birthday. And I forget what we gave him, like maybe 20 bucks, but it felt like a fortune back then. And it's like, okay, it's like, you're my friend. I'll, we'll pay the bouncer money to cut the line. Um, but then we went in and there was nobody in, in this club that was supposed to be so popular. And it's like, why is there this huge line if nobody's inside? Well, they're using that line to get people to go there rather than the next one, you know, a few blocks over or whatever. So it's that idea that like, oh, you got to get in now. This is the place to be. Um, they would just check IDs and be really slow with the stamps and hassle people just to, you know, make that line extra long. Those are kind of the three basics. Any other aspects of psychology that are relevant for you guys or that you um, 
that came to mind as I was talking? No, we don't uh, <laughs> play any of these well, games. Well, I, I think, so. yeah, no, it's it's I, just the we're starting from the like the spark of something yeah. brand new. So I think it's more about uh, seeing if we actually the thing we create actually solves the problem. Yeah, to be uh, honest, I think we intend to. I think the big problem is that. Um, kind of this book came out and it was really influential and all these people like who like sales got all excited about it and so they tried to like do things and it actually became inauthentic and didn't work as well as they had hoped because right. it's too transparent it's like you're playing games <laughs> it's like does the thing actually matter um then that's more important and the things we covered earlier with like investing a lot of effort to make it not seem complex to make it simple to understand yeah. and use um I think these are all important, but people over index on them and then do something stupid and get kind of in trouble, um, which is why I'm kind of pointing out the the failures of it more so than like examples yeah. of companies doing it well. Um, this psychology I do think is critical to understand. And this book is amazing. Um, I think last time I saw you in person, we drove down to California and I listened to this on a book on tape, but Michael Lewis, you know, uh, famous author, really great storyteller, um, wrote the story of Kahneman and Chaversky, Danny Kahneman and Amos Chaversky. And they're two um, famous, famous psychology researchers uh, who are from Israel and had um, a lot of their early papers published when they had universities there and then up coming to the U.S. and working at places like Stanford, Michigan, University of British Columbia. Um, but... Uh, Danny Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for prospect theory, and Amos Tversky would have, but um, he was already had passed away. So, which is fascinating because they're psychologists and they're not economists, and they won for um, economics. But it's because the psychology they uncovered is so relevant for economics and for um, especially relevant for the area of uh, getting someone to try something new. So prospect theory is, you know, I highly recommend reading this book or listening to the book on tape. I actually really liked it. Prospect theory is just kind of how people um, react to the prospects of gains and losses. So on this x-axis, you have objective gains and losses. And then on the y-axis, you have the subjective gains and losses. And there's a few kind of key aspects to it. And actually, another cool thing that just happened was... Um, a lot of psychology experiments have not been replicating as people have been trying to see if the results still stand. And maybe it's because context changes and society changes, or maybe because the actual methods that were used in the initial studies weren't that rigorous, you know, too small samples, or just all the incentives people have to want to um, believe the results they have are true and not be as critical as they should. But there's just a huge, large-scale replication of this, and it, it stood up. So this is something that um, we can have an increasing confidence in. But the initial idea is just that the value um, of a gain or a loss is based on the reference point. So um, getting $10 now it wouldn't be as exciting for me as getting $10 when I was you know, 20. Um, right. So our initial starting point is highly important, and I think um, that actually has profound implications for happiness research. So oftentimes we're always trying to, to get to that next level, but as soon as we get it, we get normalized to it, used to it, and we stop enjoying it. Um, so like I recommend to students that they should rent an apartment that's below their budget, that's worse than they could get when they graduate college, maybe like ideally $200 worse than uh, what their total budget is. But then at the end of the year, take that extra $2,000 and go on like an awesome vacation. Because you'll get used to your shitty countertops and the shitty cupboards and like all the problems with your apartment. It's there every single day. It's unchanging. So you quickly get adjusted to it. And any joy yeah. of something good or any pain of something not as high quality just fades into the background. Um, but looking forward to that vacation with friends, you can have enjoyment of all year long and then you get all the memories retrospectively. So this has actually been tremendously influential for happiness research um one one point uh for this innovation is if you're working on it you get so used to the benefits being there and you don't really think about um the other person's starting point 
and how the changes uh, from kind of the use case to the starting point are going to be different depending on where you are versus that new user you hope to acquire. I think um, your firm is very thoughtful about having the right composition of the team um, on your different projects and designers and like UI writers like you talked about because it's hard if you're Phil Levin, multimillionaire VC successful CEO to have that same reference point as yep. that new user or that um, low level employee or whatever drew. Okay, so um, the other thing to point out in this is that if you have some objective gain of like, let's say you get $5, the happiness you get from that falls off quicker than an, a loss. So it's like Michael Jordan's comments saying that like he, as much as he likes winning, he hates losing even more. Um, we're just very sensitive to losses. So if you're a marketer and you're trying to say, hey, buy this product, it'll make some improvement. The consumer's often thinking of, well, what's the worst case scenario? What's the pain I might encounter? So we're not necessarily able to think about gains as much because we're so loss averse. There's this whole area of loss aversion. So losses loom larger than gains to see how valuable something is. So one way you can kind of improve your launch success, um, given this prospect theory, is you really focus on avoiding making customers give something up. So how do you make something very compatible? Um, you can endow benefits by helping people try something, making it not very complex so that they get the value right away. Um, if it has high relative advantage, that's going to help. You can de-risk things because people are so loss averse and they're afraid of experiencing um, pain or, or loss. So if you can have it observable with a similar other, a reference, a testimonial, um, those are kind of the most important things to get a mainstream customer. Um, and then you want to eliminate the old. People don't want to switch to having no um, headphone plug-in on their phone. I mean, there's a whole uproar when they said they're going to launch these uh, iPhones and remove the headphone jack. Well, Apple was like, too bad. We're just going to get rid of it. So everyone's going to have yeah. to switch to Bluetooth. Um, that was much more successful. You can focus on new customers who've never used it before. So disruptions tend to enter the market for new use cases. So for the um, digital or this disposable camera, they target it to people on vacations. Because that way you don't think about how it's a worse camera. You just think about, oh, for this use case, I don't want to bring my good camera because I'm afraid of losing it or getting it lost or broken or whatever. Or they'd focus the disposable uh, or the, the Polaroid picture. Um, they focus that on grandparents who never owned a camera before. So it's not like they're getting a worse version of a camera. They're just getting some new benefits. That's the same with the keyboard. You focus on someone who doesn't already know how to type. Then they don't have to think about the cost of learning how to type because it's already going to be baked into their context. All right. Um, are you with me or should we? Following along. All yeah. right. I realize this is probably way longer than, oh my gosh, this is the longest lecture of the class. My students are going to hate it. At least they get to watch it on 2x speed. You're experiencing it on 1x speed. <laughs> but, um, all right. The additional topics to talk about um, we'll blaze through it. A lot of it they can they can read, but um, crossing the chasm. So how do you reach mainstream customers? Are you familiar with that book? Yeah. Um, it's based on a Silicon Valley investor wrote it. Um, it's related to product lifecycle a bit too. And have you heard of first mover advantage? Yeah. So basically, mm -hmm. the long story short with that one is um, it's fake. <laughs> There is no first mover advantage. Uh, it's been well documented empirically that um, oftentimes the first company to release some product is after 10 years no longer in the lead. Um, you can think of like Skype and Zoom right now as, right. as one example of that. Um, okay. So the product life cycle um, introduction, usually you're losing money. And what should you focus on in that phase versus the growth phase where you might start to make money and the maturity phase where you really get profits. So there's different kind of stages of the product's life cycle and there's different standard set of marketing tactics you should focus on for each stage. So what do you think is most important at introduction um, in terms of marketing? 
And what do I think is most important in introduction? Yeah. I guess communicating the benefits of what your product actually is and does. Yeah. Yeah. So communication, learning, um, investing in education, uh, customer success, onboarding, all that. And then with that, you can learn and standardize everything such that by the time you get to this takeoff growth stage, things can be very efficient. But you don't want to set up the standards until you've gone through the learning in this introduction stage. Um, so using this life cycle perspective, we can try to get some simple, easy to apply, common sense um, rules to follow. The only problem with it is it's not very diagnostic and it's inner, inaccurate for many firms. But um, this introduction stage, you want to learn, you want to find where you have product market fit. So who's the perfect target? Where's the consumer who's not giving up? any losses in switching to whatever you want them to do, but they get a lot of benefits. Um, you want to learn so that you can set up, you know, the frequently asked questions, standardized responses. You can figure out the best way to communicate for someone to learn. So you stimulate trial using advertising samples and public relations, and you, whatever you allocate in budget to onboarding and education, you want to triple that budget. So co-learning, adapting, fixing, um, getting it ready for the prime time use case. In the growth stage, you want repeat business. So how do you focus on retention, word of mouth, relationship building? You mentioned before Zoom has the highest NPS score. So net promoter score, that's just a kind of a metric to capture how satisfied people are, how much they'd recommend some product to their friends. So ideally, you're not trying to acquire new customers here. You're just letting your existing customers spend word of mouth and you just want to retain your existing customers, build some relationships that can stick with you um, in the long run. So you might institute brand building investments, loyalty programs. Um, you could do some custom stuff for some core uh, customers, maybe some partnerships with other providers who also serve those same customers. So you can kind of entrench yourself in their life. The maturity stage, you're really focused on increasing usage and then finding some new growth path. So what's that next product? Um, oftentimes things consolidate. So you go from maybe many competitors down to three or four competitors in, in a space. If you can, you can cross sell your customers into something new. Um, you can lower your costs to keep your profits okay. You can reimagine reima uh, what you do and think about that next evolution. Um, so I think it sounds like that's what some big companies bring you guys into is they've reached their maturity phase and they say, okay, what's next? Let's have all turtles help us imagine how we can keep our existing well, customers, but, but stretch beyond what we currently provide. I think the function we play is, well, a, a way I like to look at uh, launching innovative products or technology at companies is, uh, is this McKinsey model, the horizon model, horizon one, horizon two, horizon three. Are you familiar with this? No, give me it. Uh, uh, it's based Horizon One is basically like your existing products and services that you have, mm -hmm. like some incremental improvements. Uh, Horizon Two is how can you expand those products into new business lines that you already have, and then Horizon Three is what's some brand new shit that you know people are just kind of thinking about in R and D yeah. that could possibly happen. And what's happening more and more is. Uh, this isn't like a sequential thing that actually happens in the real world. Like there's plenty of examples where horizon three just up and happens. Mm. And uh, when something so disruptive, when you have a, uh, not just a brand new business line, but like a whole new company that launches yeah. uh, w within it, uh, it sort of just screws everything up and you're not thinking through uh, like, how do I sustain this growth or uh, how do I implement a marketing strategy that's going to, uh, create some sustained growth. It's it's more about what's something that's totally brand new um, that we're not even thinking about. So they're afraid of this. Instead of being blindsided from some other new company, how can we blindside ourselves, I guess? Yeah, exactly. So you guys are more in that innovation space, the early stages, so maybe you'll help them be aware of some new thing that could come out of left that's field. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, for us in academics, we talk about exploration versus exploitation and making it like a two by two crossover. So you can exploit your existing products or your existing customers. And exploit might be the wrong word, but it's just looking for incremental improvements along that kind uh -huh. of existing path. 
or you could take old products to new markets. So the easiest version that's just globalization. Like I got something working in the U S I'm gonna go to Canada, Mexico, right? whatever. Um, but it could be, you know, more of like a new market in terms of like we were serving dentist offices. Now we're going to go to, um, I don't know, like some other healthcare provider or real estate or restaurants or whatever. You might go to like a different industry. Um, so a different kind of customer segment. So with the, just a slight iteration of the existing product line, then you have exploration where you're going more far afield. So to something kind of outside of your initial realm with your, um, products or you're going far afield with, um, uh, the customers you serve. So there's kind of these crossover points or the diagonals are where you want to live. So an existing product for new customers or a new product for existing customers. If you can kind of hit those diagonal points first, then you can kind of go to the off diagonals is, I don't know if that's, I don't know. It's like you got the consultants out there like McKenzie that are finding what actually resonates with actual businesses. And so you get these like horizon things and you get us in the research who are kind of doing our own thing that maybe doesn't translate as well to people in business, but is trying to say similar things. Um, but maybe we're looking more um, objectively at what the data says than the consultants are just trying to pitch that they have the solution because yeah. they're getting paid for it. So exactly uh, seems similar. The decline stage. Um, I don't know. You switch companies, <laughs> get out of Dodge. Um, so crossing the chasm, um, is basically the challenge of you have some initial success, but you end up failing and dying. Why is that the case? So this is Jeffrey Moore. He was, um, basically, uh, investing in companies that seemed really promising. They had traction, they had initial users, they had some technology that was, that was seemed valuable. And yet some of his companies would reach mainstream and become very profitable and others would never get beyond those initial users, those initial enthusiastic customers. And he wanted to figure out why. So he kind of tried to figure out why and then wrote a book about what he found out. Um, and I think it's, it's relevant. You can uh, buy it and read it. It's a business week bestseller. I don't think it's very entertaining. <laughs> it's called the Bible for entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial marketing. So I just have that all right here in some slides. But if you find these, um, super important, then you can, you can go after it, um, and buy the book. But the basic idea is you need to find your lane and stay in your lane and don't deviate from your lane. So it's, it's more like once you find a customer group that resonates, avoid saying yes to other customers who also are excited about your technology or product, but would require you to change your messaging, change your customization, do some type of, of change. Because although those are inbound customers that are excited about you, that's not an efficient sales process. Um, and so you're never reaching those kind of skeptical mainstream customers. So this is chasm between the initial users and the mainstream customers. And these are the risk averse, fearful, want to make sure that everything is perfect. And these are those enthusiastic customers who will come to you and say, hey, I heard you have this new technology. Can you build us an application? Or... You know, those, this is like this inbound customers. And so what happens is he was investing in companies at this green stage, and then only some of them would get to this blue stage. And it was kind of painful um, that some companies would die. And what he found out by talking to people is basically that some of these companies at this green stage were going from like one customer segment to another customer segment, but they're always interacting with these enthusiastic early adopter type customers who would tolerate glitches. They would tolerate problems they would be demanding and ask for customization and it's just a very kind of laborious uh inefficient way of of saying um getting revenue but what you should still what you should do is instead of like once you've done a good job satisfying one customer in one kind of let's say segment you should just not go to that next customer in a different segment you should just painfully wait to get that mainstream customer such that you've figured out how to serve a mainstream customer who is risk averse, who is, um, you know, looking for the total solution, everything already worked out, all the kinks worked out and it's hard to get there, but it's, but be stubborn and wait to cross that chasm rather than go to a new customer in another place. Um, cause once you do get to that blue customer, now you got testimonials, you got references, you've got the whole solution worked out and you can efficiently scale up. Um,
Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm trying to think through examples of products that have successfully crossed the chasm versus those that have not. Do you, can you share with us? Um, I mean, the book has lots of examples from his own investing uh -huh. career. They're all old. So I'm trying to think of like a newer one that would be relevant to, and all of them are like in, in B2B spaces. So like uh -huh. talks about like these Xerox data management uh, products that were invested in like back in the nineties. And I'm trying to think of stuff that's more, um, recent, but, uh, maybe Tesla with electric vehicles, Connor, my battery's dying. I'm going to okay. reposition myself. All right. Um, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we'll see if an example comes to mind, but, um, the idea is that the first customers you get are not like the mainstream customers that you want to get to. And so you can go from different types of early adopters, but if you aren't kind of being stubborn and focusing on getting to the early majority, um, using testimonials, getting the complete solution worked out for a particular customer type, you'll just kind of drown yourself expensively serving a lot of um, different early adopters, but never really get to this efficient way of reaching a mainstream customer. Um, yeah, I mean, Tesla is so far done a really good job of getting early adopters and to some extent, you'd say they'd violated this a bit because like they went from like serving car customers to serving like, you know, big utility companies, which would be like the problem of like you get the enthusiastic car customers and then you go serve like the enthusiastic utility companies by selling those battery packs. And then, we'll, oh, let's go into solar, solar roofs. That's exciting. We'll get the enthusiastic customers who bought our car to buy our solar roofs. And the Crossing the Chasm book would say, no, like just focus on cars and try to figure out how to get a mainstream um, user of the car to buy your car and don't jump from like one type of customer and one type of product and just kind of keep flittering around with a bunch of enthusiastic early adopters get the total solution um, that will help you win like a skeptical risk averse but pragmatist which is this who represents the early majority you're not going to get the conservatives until you get the pragmatists and you're only going to get the pragmatists if you really are stubborn and, and kind of go through this kind of pit of, they kind of did that with the model S I'd say. It's like they had this initial lift off, then things got stuck, and then they broke through and, and got to some of the more pragmatists as they got the cost down and did the, um, uh, got the battery life up. But it was scary for a moment with Tesla as they were kind of, it's like ex out of money. Yeah. They're experiencing pain with their cars. So they're like, Oh, we'll go into battery storage or we'll go into solar roofs. And ultimately that could pay off. But, um, they, you need to kind of get to that breakthrough to get the pragmatist, the customer who's needs to see someone else with the car and needs to like have their friends show them how it works before they end up buying. It's like, as you kind of scale up to more and more customers, you're going from like very enthusiastic early adopter types to very conservative, like I need it tried and true and I need to make sure all the kinks have been worked out. I'm not taking any risks. And the way to get them is you get similar other, similar other, similar other. So every customer that is along the way has to be the same product and very similar to the previous customer. So it's better to be like the big fish in the small pond than jump around from pond to pond and just get all this inbound enthusiasm, which feels good for a entrepreneur who's struggling, but it's not going to ultimately get you to break through. Mm. I think a big part is like the psychology of the entrepreneur and the psychology of the early adopter fit. And so entrepreneurs sometimes just want to hang out in early adopter land and they keep flittering really from place to place. And it's like too many pivots, just like lose for a while, but figure out how to get that pragmatist and suffer the pain of figuring out how to cross this chasm. This is where companies die. They die because, not because they go for the pragmatist, they die because they just want to stick around in, in early adopter land. And uh, that's a small market. That's a small part of the market. So you just like, yeah. you jump to different variations, but it's expensive and you never get to profitability. The chasm. Um, so this is kind of, the summary of everything I just talked about, but or we won't 
walk through it all right now, but my students will get the slides so they can they can read it. Um, it's a slide talking about the innovators and their psychology. Um, there's a slide talking about the early adopters and their psychology. They're very demanding. They want intensive support. That's why they're not very profitable to serve. But they'll come to you, so it's hard to turn them down. It's like I had, I got a few um, clients who are in the restaurant industry, and now I'm getting their friend who's a realtor. Oh, let me do digital marketing for the realtor. No, just like perfect everything you do for just restaurants. Um, that would be the, the kind of version of it. You have to get these risk-averse customers who want proven applications, reliable service, the whole product. Or they want references, they want testimonials, but only from similar others, not from other you know, early adopters. Um, if you can win them, you'll find success. Okay, so the big takeaway is um, be very thoughtful around who you target. Find a very narrow group that talks a lot to each other, like eBay did with all those Beanie Baby collectors and traders. Then you'll diffuse through them. You'll become a big fish in that small pond. You'll get those risk-averse people who want to see similar other customers having had success with what you do. You want to have a feature roadmap to keep things simple at first, but then eventually um, expand your offering. And you want to have a user roadmap, which is, again, you, you're very sticky around who you go after at first, but then eventually you can kind of use them to reach a similar other customer who's a little bit further afield in terms of the use case that they're looking for. We talked about Roger's five factors, um, which shows up in having things compatible, simple, invest, invest, invest in education, and make sure you play the telephone game where I can tell you what my product's about, and then you can tell someone else what it's about, and the messaging and the promise still gets delivered. Um, try to reduce risk, use warranties, trial periods. Freemium is risky, we talked about that, how it can kind of go wrong. Um, Try to enhance the visibility of, of what you do. Okay, so when you go ahead with your launch plan, you want to have all these addressed in your launch plan. So you can kind of read your launch plan if you type it out and say, how much are we thinking about all these different aspects of all the research that's been done in this space is kind of brought together on this slide and you just want to be critical and say, have I been thoughtful about all of these? Um, one company that's awesome at this is Birchbox. They do little small things to try to encourage their customers to share. So they have their boxes be pink instead of brown. It's more visible. They try to get people to have them delivered to their office rather than to their home because then there's more communication. If mm -hmm. I can, if you're my existing customer, most likely if you tell someone about my product, you're going to tell someone else who's likely to use my product. Um, for not a lot of money, I can add a little adjective in front of the name of the user, and then they're much more likely to post about it on social media. So, um, I don't know, I got excited with my animation here. <laughs> All right, I talked about this first mover advantage. The research says there is no first mover advantage. The failure rate of the pioneer is actually around 50% 10 years later, and only 11% of the pioneer to any category is the ultimate leader after 10 years. So we talk about first mover advantage, but Oftentimes, the first mover is that suffers from that psychology of not crossing the chasm, being an early adopter and only serving early adopter customers, um, not working out all the kinks and being stubborn and figuring out how to serve the mainstream customer. So if you can be best, you can come in and beat who's ever first. And that's why I kind of laugh when I knew someone asks me to like sign an NDA or something because they want to tell me about their idea and they think I'm going to steal it. It's like, hey, I don't want to steal your ideas. I don't want to do all the hard work. Execution's hard. And even if you are launching first, someone will come in and see, uh, oh, you figured out there's a problem. And we'll come and try to do it even better. Um, so this is just one example. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Quick word, quick word of advice with students on N N NDAs. Mm. Uh, if, you're, if you're actually thinking about like pitching investors about your product, don't have them sign an NDA. Yeah, yeah it just shows you more into litigation than you are into creating something new and, and marketing yeah. it. Um, so uh, a lot of people think this is McDonald's. It's from 1964 to 1967. It's the world's biggest chain of highway restaurants, a pioneer in restaurant franchising, the most strongly entrenched factor in the industry, and the most fabulous success. Have you watched Mad Men? Uh, yeah. 
Yes. So Don Draper uh, goes and uh-huh. goes up to this restaurant and he has some ice cream with uh, the French Canadian um, wife of his. I forget her name. And then they went to the Howard Johnson, which they basically, as the highway system was built, they built a bunch of restaurants on the off ramps and it was very successful, but it was a come in, dine, relax. And mm-hmm. ultimately, the drive through where you don't want to stop and just want to keep going and end up uh, surpassing them. So you can innovate, but you got to continually adapt as the use cases evolve. In all of these um, categories, the people, people, the uh, company people think is the pioneer is actually not often the pioneer. So who is the pioneer of personal computers? What company? launched the first personal computer do you think <laughs> i don't know the answer to this <laughs> yeah you're gonna get them all wrong yeah <laughs> go ahead and guess though we'll uh, shame you publicly. I, I i have no idea it's some some company that doesn't exist anymore How about apple? Can't what's that apple yeah that'd be a guess okay. but no video recorders yeah i don't know sony sony is the guess that is most common most common guess disposable diapers huggies uh pampers is, pampers is the most common guess okay. light beer Coors light yeah miller light is the most common guess for the first light beer safety razors yeah i don't know gillette yeah, that's what everyone guesses soft drinks uh royal crown cola <laughs> yeah most people guess coca-cola <laughs> uh right. copiers yeah xerox yeah. word processing software do you remember your first word yeah. processing software Probably a Microsoft product, but maybe not. Uh, yeah, WordPerfect, I think, was the first one I used. But, uh, um, web browser. Yeah, Netscape. Yeah, everyone gets that. Online bookseller. Amazon. Yeah. And microprocessor. <laughs> Probably can't name any microprocessor companies unto themselves. So. Intel. Intel. Yeah. So that's what the survey typically says. Uh, the, uh-huh. the actual truth of the matter is a bunch of companies that don't exist anymore. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. goes to your point though, like 95% of companies fail. I love this books.com. Like, you know, Oh, sign a NDA. I'm going to sell books online. It's a great idea. Like people don't really need to touch it or feel it beforehand. They just need to know what the book is. Um, we'll have them warehouses. It'll be great. Oh, Amazon's going to come in and steal it. Intel actually is, I think maybe the only one that is actually the same creator. But MITS, I'm guessing that has something to do with MIT. Um, right. Probably some spin off of that. Ampex, no idea what that is. Chuck's Chalmers Red Letter, never had one of those. Yeah. Just besides Intel, it's. A- I mean, it's it's advice that we constantly give to entrepreneurs in our studio, too. It's, it's, there's no use in trying to be different. Like, just, just focus on being good. Yeah. Like, it's hard enough to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Being best is all that ultimately matters. And, how do you be best? Not by being first. Um, right. <laughs> by, yeah, uh, learning what actually will stick and entrenching yourself. Um, so the other thing that um, is important when you're launching anything new is predicting demand for a whole bunch of reasons, but mostly logistics, operation. And there's different distribution of curves, and that's got a lot of attention recently with the coronavirus. Like, what's the curve? What part are we at the curve? You know, can we flatten the curve? Um, so what happens is depending on the characteristics of the product, they tend to follow different curves. And so you can look for a similar product and you can predict out what your curve will be. So like a beanie baby is a fad that looks kind of like this because it's not actually that useful of a product. It's only useful to the extent that it's socially deemed useful. And so if the whole utility is only a social construct, it can rise super rapidly, but it also will fall super rapidly as kind of people's social um, value of it changes. So you see that with fashion, like is, you know, baggy jeans better than tight jeans? Well, objectively, who can say, but we've seen that come and go um, in our time. Just watching like the last dance with Michael Jordan, it's funny to watch all the 90s um, gear and stuff. So like record player, microwave ovens, they kind of this slow but long build, not very fast. Um, compact disc players like the Sony Walkman or CD players um, much faster. One big difference is these are stuck inside or these can go outside. So just being out in the world, you see this faster initial growth 
um, because you get more of that imitation factor, where this relies more just on innovation because it's hidden away inside the home. Mm. Um, oftentimes, as a company, you're trying to get to that next iteration of the product to kind of keep things going. So it all comes down to basically how much are you going to have an actual innovation that has use in people's life, and then how much imitation will occur, or how much word of mouth will occur. And you can try to push on those two things, but oftentimes it's just the nature of the product itself. And we talked about pushing on those, but you need to mathematically model this, um, which is what all these you know, virologists are trying to do right now with coronavirus. And as we learn more about the disease, our model gets better. And as we learn more about the mitigation tactics, our model has to adapt because if people put on masks versus don't put on masks, it's going to change the imitation element of it. Um, so you want to think of the number of people at any given time. That's kind of that point on that curve, that flattened curve. So the number of people that are new infections or total infections. And you think about the innovation. So of all the people that could get the disease or could buy the Walkman product, um, you want to multiply that by how useful it is. Or in this case, like how good is the virus that actually um, kind of beating your immune system and taking hold. And then if it's spread by coughing and talking, obviously it's um, going to have more of this imitation effect versus if it's spread by uh, other things. So we can't do much about this innovation effect with the coronavirus. People are talking about maybe you could take certain you know, pills up front that will make you, you know, basically be better able to fight it off. But we can do a lot around this imitation effect. So that's that quarantine, that's that wearing mask, social distancing. We're trying to work on on this and this really matters about how many people have already been infected or how many active infections are there because those are the people that can affect us these p's and q's quotients often come from um other examples that came before so like we know what how sars spread or we know how mers spread or we know how different coronaviruses spread so we can take these quotients from existing data that we have um so this is how easy could your body fight off the disease, and this is um, how likely will you encounter someone with the disease. And those two things together basically determine how many new people will get the disease at any given point in time. Or when we're mm -hmm. thinking about it in terms of business, we want to think of it in terms of sales, because we need to have enough, you know, if it's a physical product, it's a lot harder than if it's like software. With software, you just can make duplicates. Um, but if it's like I have to actually manufacture cars or whatever, um, there's a whole logistics element that comes into play. So uh, I actually built one of these models for the coronavirus. Um, okay. I did the vast diffuse model. I predicted it for Oregon because you could find them for other places, but I was curious like about Oregon and Lane County itself. Um, and me and another professor, we were updating our vast diffuse. It's named after a guy um, who took it from epidemiology and, and adapted it to the business world. Um, so uh, this is this innovation effect, which usually you get your customers who would get the most value out of something to encounter it first. We also see that um, in saying herd immunity. How many people have to get affected for herd immunity? Well, the people who are most likely to get affected with it probably got infected first. And the people who have the worst immune system are probably going to get infected first. So that usually dies out over time. So like um, people with the worst immune systems, people who travel the most, they're going to encounter it the first time. So oftentimes, the, as investors, you see, oh, they got good sales initially. Let's pour money into it. But you don't realize that, oh, the customers they got already are the ones who are most likely to get something valuable out of it. That next incremental customer is getting less benefit out of it. The only time that flips, if, if it's something with like a network effect, it's like the more people that have Zoom, the more value I get out of it because I can connect with someone else. Or the more people that have Facebook, the more value I get from joining Facebook because all my friends are already on it. But I can also tip the other way. So if there's not a network effect, it typically declines over time. And that's why you get a lot of overestimation, overcapacity gets built out. Um, the imitation effect increases over time until you get to the point you've saturated the market and then it starts to decline. So if you understand this very well, you're less likely to overbuild capacity or to underproduce uh, capacity 
and you can be more accurate in your predictions. Um, we talked about all these already, which is just kind of mapping both the innovation factors to the earlier parts of the slides and the imitation factors to earlier parts of the slides. That's like the eBay, the nature of the links for eBay and the nature of the participants. They already had established communication channels. It was much better. That's why eBay beat their competitor. Um, this is just one example that was critical is DirecTV had to literally launch satellites into outer space. If they launched too many, then they wouldn't be uh, cost efficient and they wouldn't be profitable. They would have gone out of business. If they launched too few, the service quality for per user would have been not good enough. So they used the best diffusion model. They based it on the adoption of cable TV and other kind of home entertainment devices. They actually outperformed their model, but their model was accurate enough that they were able to um, have enough satellites in outer space to meet their demand. They needed five-year forecast, which is pretty intense. Um, so yeah, they did things based on like cable TV, VCRs, and they're only 16% below the actual amount. It justified earlier launches of their satellite and was worth a ton of money. So just a little bit of math um, can pay off in a big way. Here's a graph of... So from 94 um, to 99, you can see in 1992, this blue line is their forecast and they were just a little bit below what actually happened. And they think the reason why it was a little bit better than what actually happened was because of that satellite being outside of the home. There's a little bit more of an awareness of it and a little bit more of an excitement factor of getting TV from outer space. So additional like status that maybe led to an outperformance of what their model um, predicted. But kind of cool, um, nerdy stuff. Anyways, that's that end. That's all I know about uh, innovative or being entrepreneurial when it comes to marketing. You do it for real life. Um, I think it's always fun talking to you or other people and hearing how what actually matters or actually is used kind of is different than what I'm reading and getting data on and analyzing. But um, what's the three biggest takeaways that you'd say people need to consider? Either I brought up or just separately I missed. Um, three biggest takeaways. That's good. Uh, focusing on communicating the actual value of your product early. So this is like, it doesn't matter if you have a bad product, like it, it's too hard. It's, you can do marketing on bad products and all the tactics and channels apply. Um, but it doesn't matter. It's going to be a way harder job. So that's really focusing on actually solving a problem. That's like by far and away the number one thing. Yeah. That's useless to get ahead of yourself and think about the promotional campaign or the um, distribution strategy or whatever if people aren't uh, having some unmet need that yeah. You know. The problem is if it's uh, hardware or something where you have to manufacture the thing, how do you know ahead of time? I guess Kickstarter is kind of an innovation there right. where you get some early feedback to see if it's worth building. Uh, name name three memorable Kickstarter products. products. Yeah, I remember some coat someone made with lots of zippers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, there's got to be something. I guess I, th I heard board games are popular. They get launched on Kickstarter a lot. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not into board games. Um, okay, so product, 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 or actual unmet need, unmet need, unmet need. Um, what's number two? Yeah, I think not worrying about being first is really important. Um, I mean, it, it goes back to point number one. Yeah. It, it, it just like it, there's your, your chart that shows the, uh, the list of companies that yeah. you know, the presumed incumbents and the presumed market leaders and the presumed, yeah. uh, you know, first movers uh, are comp all out of business. I don't recognize any of them, yeah. you know, besides in Intel. Yeah, nine out of ten. Yeah. So I think that's pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... I agree. It's being best and, and getting the use case. And I think part of that goes to the psychology of the entrepreneur and wanting the enthusiasm of people validating, hey, you created something new. It's great. So they stick to serving these early adopter customers and pivoting and 
mess around with that rather than struggling to reach the skeptical, you know, risk averse, fearful uh, customer with inertia, that mainstream customer. So being stubborn of, okay, I found the use case, I found the customer segment that gets the most value out of it. I'm going to go through the early adopters in that and then persist and try to reach a mainstream skeptic. Um, you know, for, and, and for now, you, you found them for now, you know, before, before you're completely un, upended and disrupted. You know, we, we ended on a direct, direct TV example with, uh, you know, a, a log graph up to 1999 yeah. and, and, and then online video. Yeah, you know, and eventually then, it went like this. Yeah. Yeah. Which is crazy because that company was looking for, in some ways, it started out with this idea of we can say there's this constant need for entertainment in the home and we'll take a new technology to serve that need. But then when the next technology came along to serve that need, they weren't as enthusiastic adopting it. So it's like, why is that? Why are they so wedded to their technical solution and not curious about what the next technical solution was to that? same constant the need is constant the way of serving it evolves you'd hope a company would be adaptive but apparently not um it's like uh exit satellite radio spotify right why is why is you know howard stern went to uh, xm radio but now joe rogan just got paid a hundred million dollars to go to spotify <laughs> it's like you see these things happening over and over again but somehow companies are unable to adapt all right number three what is number three what stays yeah. with you what do you care number... about a lot when you're <sighs> I, i'm failing fast is the big one like embracing a fear of failure uh you know being find ways to be public yeah. about it and vocal about it early you know, user like... feedback or yeah exactly it's just the the power of iterative trial and error yeah yeah i think um when it comes to marketing it's a lot about messaging if you're not actually tweaking the product at least find out what the best message is that's the most not the best the most simple because you've right. got to meet your potential customers in a land of distraction noise stress you know whatever is going on in their life and so you need a simple way of cutting through um which is critically hard. What about all the yeah. glitz and glam of like scarcity stuff like that? You think maybe downplay that because it's you end up kind of doing something inauthentic if you focus too much on like all the edge cases of getting it perfect. I don't know. Give me an example. Well, like we talked about like authority and getting on New York Times bestseller list and stuff. Do you think um, or like scarcity and the idea of like saying like buy now before it sells out? I mean, go look in your promotions tab in your Gmail. Yeah. <laughs> you know, do you, re do you care? Do you recognize any of them? Do any of them stand out? They're all using that tactic. Yeah, exactly. So I, although it's real, it's done inauthentically or done too purposefully that yeah. it ends up not being so important. Um, yeah. I think the influencer space is, is interesting, but um, it ends up being that maybe the influencers capture all the value and the company is just going to get value extracted from them um right i don't know it's better to be i guess like a kylie jenner than it is to be whatever the company is that works with her yeah uh, yeah exactly i don't know okay cool um partying wisdom beyond marketing oh god 10 a.m on a sunday know. yeah w wash your hands and wear a mask <laughs> brilliant all right thanks so much for coming on everyone check out all turtles john has a podcast that i think is actually great um if you listen to well not just you it's your whole team there that produces it that has a lot of um designers talking about ui design that i think is really good for this actual examples of um getting the messaging clear and um trying to find if there's really an unmet need there yeah um, so cool thanks allturtlespodcast.com yeah soon to be acquired by spotify for a hundred million dollars yeah we'll see <laughs> all right thanks <laughs>